Okay, welcome to the Transform Investment Webinar Series. Today is the 5th of July 2017. We have a special session today. We're doing a panel review session for the Assessment and Higher Education Conference. So Sally Jordan, as the Chair of the session, would you like to begin, please? Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, can everybody just indicate that you can hear me okay? We get a few. That sounds fine. Or at least one tick. That sounds good. It's okay at my end. Um, we have noticed that we've got a slight delay on the system. We don't think that's affecting sound, but it may affect the transition of slides, I suspect. But anyway, I shall give it a go. So I'm just going to summarise the, the um, conference that was held actually just last week in, in Manchester. Quite a few people um, who are here today were also at the conference, but that's great. It's an opportunity to, to share what we had at the conference and also um, you know, to, to, to uh, listen to some more papers, even if you were there. Um, so it's the uh, biennial assessment in higher education conference. Um, there were around about 200 of us there last week uh, from 22 countries, so it, it's truly international. Um, there's a, an idea there of the flavour of the conference. We had uh, a lot of papers and practice exchanges, so obviously it's impossible for any one person to get to it. And we do have a reputation as being a very friendly conference, um, and I particularly found that this time. Um, I'm on the organising committee. I work at the Open University, but um, a lot of the organisation um, comes out of uh, Cumbria. Um, which is a delightful place just close to the English Lake District in, in northwest of England. Um, the conference operates with themes. Um, the themes are there. You'll see that one that's particularly uh, close to our heart historically in transforming assessment is um, integrating digital tools and technologies for assessment. But increasingly, I think a lot of us are actually interested in the in assessment across its breadth, um, in terms of the, you know, the, the 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 wider implications, assessment and feedback as a as a as a general principle, and I think that will be reflected in the talks that we're going to hear this morning. Um, we had two keynote presentations. Um, the second of those, as you'll see, was technology enhanced assessment. Uh, Denise was exploring. Um, essentially some, some of the strengths and weaknesses of technology enhanced assessment. Um, but Jan MacArthur in the first of the keynotes explored, I think, what was one of the other central themes. It was a very, very interesting one. It was really exploring some of the power balances that there are in the world of assessment, um, the concept of um, you know, assessment being done to students um, as opposed to a, a collective activity. Um, it was a very, 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 very interesting um, thing. And, and as uh, someone's just posted, there is a there's a Twitter feed. There's a lot of activity around that. A lot of comments on Jan's keynote. Um, what we've done um, is that, I, as I say, I'm on the conference uh, organising committee, and it's a peer-reviewed conference, and so the the um, presentations that were accepted were, were all were all reviewed, were all looked at. I basically then saw all the abstracts and picked three of them. Now I picked the three because I thought they would work um, for brief resume, just to give um, the general world a, 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 a flavour for what happened. And so these are the three presentations that we have today. Um, essentially, they are. Um, Matthew has, has quite rightly picked out there's a common theme around feedback, um, but they are chosen really just to be indicative of the flavour of the conference as a whole. And just to give you a feeling for how the rest of the, oh yes, Kevin, they are interesting titles. Um, well, there we are. We'll, we'll go on and listen to the intriguing talks. I've had the benefit of hearing them all once before. I was able to get to all of them at the conference. So I'm still looking forward to hearing them again. So just quickly to reiterate, um, speakers, I will stop you after uh, 15 minutes. I'll probably just turn my microphone on and um, make sort of loud coughing noises if you're going on for more than 15 minutes. The idea is that each speaker will talk for maybe about 12 minutes and then there'll be opportunity for questions if we have time at the end. And we do need to finish promptly today. But if we have time at the end, um, then I will also um, have a general chat. Um, so do keep the questions coming in the chat box. 
So without further delay, I'm going to hand over to uh, Carol and Jane who are going to talk about models of examination feedback. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Sally. So I'm going to talk today about a project that was funded um, by uh, the Teaching and Learning Fund at Plymouth University. It's undertaken by myself, Carol Sutton, uh, Joanne Selick and Jane Collins. And this is a project that was focusing on exploring different models of examination feedback. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with this model of feeding, feed forward and feedback. Um, and I just wanted to put this model up here um, now just to say that uh, this model supports inclusive assessment and it is a key aspect of university uh, assessment strategy. So it's one of the underpinnings for the development of the examination feedback uh, toolkit that we went on to produce as part of um, this project. And it's just to say that I've posted the URL in the chat room and my colleague Jane is going to be um, monitoring any questions and answering it um, and then in the chat room. So with um, no further ado, I shall move on to the next slide and just run through the key stages in the um, examination feedback project. So it had four stages. The first stage was a pre-survey where we captured um, and spoke with students as well in one-to-one -one meetings um, to gain an understanding of their understanding of examinations, their perceptions of examinations, their experiences of preparing for exams, and their experiences of receiving feedback and then what they did with that feedback. The first thing that came out of that was that they wanted more feedback. Perhaps not unsurprisingly. Secondly, was that exam habits that they had from um, and preparation habits that they had from previous courses, even where they'd not been very successful in the exam, were still being um, used um, in their current studies. So, exam preparation that they'd had at A level, they were then using it uh, during their degree, even though we may be uh, in having different um, opportunities for um, learning different ways of exam preparation, old habits were still there. <clears throat> the second stage of this exam feedback project was a review of both the academic and grey literature around um, uh, exam feedback and models of examination feedback. So this included us looking at other institutions' examination assessment policies where we could find them online. The third stage was the production of a staff toolkit, which was there to support academic staff in developing an examination strategy, strategy that was inclusive in their modules. This toolkit was piloted both at Plymouth University's Teaching and Learning Conference through a workshop and was also piloted by staff using it in the delivery of modules in sociology and law programmes at the university. The final stage was um, capturing some data from students uh, via a post-exam survey and also a small number of one-to-one -one interviews with students in those sociology and law modules um, to find, to, to understand how they had um, experienced the um, exam itself. Okay. So moving on. Okay, so I want to start by just out outlining the two main outcomes of the project. The first was that it led to a change in the University of Plymouth assessment policy. Up until now, the assessment policy had distinguished between assessment and examination in terms of feedback. Now that policy um, has been reworded to say that students should expect to receive constructive feedback after all assessments including examinations. The second outcome was the examination toolkit itself for staff and um, it's this toolkit which you can download from the URL um, linked in the chat room um, gives a range of different ways of a formative and summative assessment that can be used uh, within modules. 
So in terms of the examination feedback, feedback toolkit itself, <clears throat> the key um, areas that um, came uh, out of the toolkit and through uh, the academic review of literature and also speaking to staff was that obviously the type of exam needs to be um, closely aligned to the learning outcome. So it needs to be fit for purpose. There were some practical con considerations in the type of uh, exam feedback that gets used and they can, those that can be linked to the size of the student cohort, the type of student that you have, where those students are located, so they're campus based um, Monday to Friday or at weekends or maybe blended delivery. There are some issues around the timing of the exam both within the semester and also the academic year and linked to the marking period as well. And for staff that want to engage students back with their examination scripts, it's how they actually access those exam scripts and any institutional um, uh, considerations that there might be there. So here's some key factors that, we, that you know, both practical and um, theoretical as well. So just on this slide, um, we've got a number of tables in the toolkit, but I've just put this slide out um, to give you a flavour of examples of different types of feedback, both formative and summative, that can be used uh, with students. So you know, your feedback might be generic in traditional written format, um, it might be um, verbal or audio, um, it could be individual written feedback or audio feedback, and there will be um, way in which that's delivered might be electronic through and electronically through email or Moodle. It may be through one-to-one -one appointments, and it may be through group feedback or open days. Um, and there's also the issue of how you link that feedback into wider TBT. So I just want to move on now to give you um, a flavour of some of the um, impact that this toolkit had in terms of one of the case studies that we've got. And it's the one um, from my own discipline area that sociology that I'm going to talk about here. So um, one of my colleagues, Jonathan Clark, runs a social and political theory module. It's in final year, autumn semester of the degree. Um, a few years ago, it used to be an unseen exam paper. He's moved it to a seen exam paper that's in an essay style format where the students have complete two questions in two hours. This theme exam paper gets released in December. The timing of the exam paper release coincided with support Q&A sessions for the students and opportunities for them to work on the exam questions and to receive feedback from the staff member in a group setting um, and also one-to-one -one around um, that, that outlines for that. The students then sat their exam in the January and in February, Jonathan um, met with all of the students to give them group feedback on the exam that consisted of um, the uh, answers that he would have, um, or points that he would like to have seen raised in the uh, essay questions, responses. Um, he also gave them an opportunity to um, review their exam script, and so this had to take place within the classroom and the exam scripts were distributed and taken back in. He gave very clear guidance that these exam scripts could only be looked at by the individual student, they were not to be shared and nor was their original mark to be shared. This session was then followed up with an individual invitation for one-to-one -one feedback if the students um, wanted it. It has to be said that very few students actually then requested one-to-one -one feedback. It was no more than three or four students out of the cohort of 30. The interesting thing about this case study is the impact that it had on average exam marks, which is on the table on the right-hand side. And you can see how these is average exam marks have increased um, over the uh, years. And um, the other interesting thing about these marks is that they started to uh, align themselves to uh, the individual's performance within their coursework as well. So there's less of a disparity in the box between the two. In terms of feedback from students, here are just some um, key points that came out of the feedback. 
And what I want to do is just read you a couple of student quotes. So the first one is, previously my examination preparation was, here is the examination question, and I'd go off and do my own research. This way was really helpful. It made me think about the exam differently. It stopped me getting nervous about it because I discussed my ideas and then got confirmation of my ideas. So it was really helpful. And I did better than I expected to compared to previous years. Another student, I got better than I expected. It surprised me a lot, in a good way. I put it down to the way I prepared for the exam. My, exam, my marks were 10 to 15 percent higher. I was so happy with this. I put extra effort into the exam. The module leader was interested in my exam preparation, and that made me want to do better. I have lots of other quotes as well that are really interesting. So there are practical staff challenges here, uh, and real challenges in terms of workload and time that it takes to make those practical arrangements. Um, in, ter in terms of timetabling, uh, additional group sessions, arranging one-to-one -one slots. For those students that maybe failed the exam, how you then incorporate feedback into that recent period for the examination. There are challenges around the time management um, and, 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 and large cohorts. Um, it has to be said that the sociology um, it, uh, pilot was on a cohort of 30. And it might require a very different approach if you have 300 students on the module. Um, there is a sensitivity around returning an exam script in a grouped uh, environment and the need to ensure privacy around the grade for the individual. And feedback, as like all feedback, needs to be both clear and not only feed in, but also think about how the feedback is translates across different academic uh, uh, years as well. So just some finally to sum up, here are just some emerging themes. The first overarching one, of course, is that exams are just another form of assessment, so students should expect feedback um, on their exam um, grade so they understand it and, how, and then take that forward in order that they can improve their performance. The, um, the, those logistical considerations, some of those which I've already outlined in my previous um, slides, a, a further one to, con to consider here is actually, um, unlike with other forms of written system that may be submitted um, electronically through e-submission, there is no form of e-submission for exams so that creates some really practical um, challenges in terms of how you give um, written feedback to students on their exams, and that, that caused some challenges and over the law lecture. And there are challenges as well about thinking about the timing of the feedback, particularly if it's a year one or year two module, uh, that when there's an exam in the second semester, students go away for the summer, quite often aren't around when that feedback's ready, so it's now thinking about how that feedback can be incorporated into the start of the next academic year. And I just want to finish by one final point, which is a concern for all staff, and we've all got this um, pressures as well as teaching pressures, is that any uh, workload uh, implications for changing exam um, feedback, um, that it inevitably takes longer and how that's managed. So that's the end of my slides. Thank Carol, you thank you very much indeed. You presented that very well, and we're, we're almost exactly on the 15 minutes. Um, I know, Carol, you've got to go, so I'm actually know, going sorry to... I you go. No, it's fine. I'm going to um, just very quickly raise one of the questions that have been asked. It's been quite some very interesting discussion going on in the chat box, which we obviously will keep so that we've got that taking the, the work forward. Um, there's been quite a lot of discussion around the... Um, the, the whole issue of, of, of um, people being marks oriented because of it being an exam. But I'm going to pick yeah. up on the one that um, that was asked right at the beginning and then Matthew picked up at the end as well. Kevin was pointing out the um, the feeling that staff are under pressure, um, particularly in the exam, because giving feedback uh, precludes the reuse of questions um, in in future exams. I don't know. Do you have any any experience of that? 
Uh, well, um, in terms of, I mean, there's a wider issue of question, I think, there is around, around uh, internal scrutiny processes for examination questions anyway. So at Plymouth, there's um, a policy that you can't reuse your examination questions. Yes. Yeah, so I think that's really that, that's really really helpful. It is, you know, in a sense, you're left thinking, you know, you may very much makes you think about who, what, who assessments for, isn't it? Anyway, I am going to move yeah. on to be fair to the other speakers, Carol and uh, Jane as well. Thank you very much indeed, and I'm going to hand over now to Judy. So Judy, if you click on your talk button, and then we can move the slides forward. You you do that as well. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. I'm here. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about team-based learning and uh, we call it in the social science module because I think it applies really across the board anywhere where you've got um, a broad range of ability in students. What I'll be talking about is the particular module um, which happened to be economics taught to a business program and then outline the differences between team-based learning and say group work the problems that we had or the um, interesting aspects of implementing team-based learning and then um, basically what we've done since then. So the module in question was actually stage two, so that's a second year module. Um, that was one concern um, actually because we'd aimed really to target first years. Um, but although it was a second year module, it was level four, so it should have been fairly easy content for the students because, of course, they were most of their work was at level five, but this was a level four module. Um, the other concern was that it's optional for business and management students, um, but it was compulsory for students in the accounting and finance degree. So we had two distinct types of students, those on the accounting program and those who had actually enrolled for business and management and uh, of course didn't have such a quantitative background. So some of the concerns arose around attendance. It was very poor attendance towards the end of the module last year. There was maybe six or eight students actually coming to lectures, which of course is really quite poor. Um, very poor engagement with the work and quite low marks, um, which um, you know was really quite a worry since they should have been doing much better than that. So after we looked around to see what type of um, methodology would actually work well to improve that kind of engagement and to maybe get the students doing some peer teaching, the reason for that was that we had students who were coming in maybe with A-level grades in maths and would have qualified for a maths degree and then we also had some students in the, pro, in the module who really only had grades, um, low GCSE grades, so there was a huge range of ability um, and of course that made the teaching even more difficult because you, you, know, you don't want to leave people behind but uh, you don't want to bore the ones who are actually, um, you know, beyond some of the GCSE level maths. So we opted to go for team-based learning and it is very different to group work. It's a type of flipped learning so a lot of the material is put online, there was videos developed um, as well as just straight out lecture materials. What we didn't do is actually video the lecturer giving the lecture. The, um, it was written materials or YouTube videos or additional readings. Uh, student, the idea is that students go through that material and then when they come to the lecture they go through something called the readiness assurance process. That consists of two parts. There is an individual multiple choice um, quiz where students do that by themselves and then they get into their team to go through the same questions again. In the team the students work together to work out what the correct answer is and then they get immediate feedback by um, using the scratch cards and these are the scratch cards that we actually purchased from the team-based learning organisation in the US so it took uh, a few weeks for those to arrive but we had them on deck and I think that that was very good because students get an immediate result for their team at multiple choice, they can work at their own pace within that lecture time and also it allows a grading so if they um, if they get the answer correct the first time, they get a certain mark and the mark's reduced if they have to keep scratching off the card to get the 
additional marks. After doing the assurance process in a regular team-based learning setup, the students would then move on to an application exercise, which is, um, if you think of Bloom's taxonomy, where you've already done the recall and understanding of facts, now it's applying that to a particular situation. Uh, that it's important that the situation doesn't have a single yes or no answer. It's something that's discussed, which um, the students can debate. And then, of course, as a team, um, they debate that. And then uh, when the answer is revealed, the teams debate why they've come up with that solution. The other element of team-based learning, which is important and which I think we didn't do terribly well, is that the students rate each other on their contribution to the team. Uh, bearing in mind that the team is an equal um, participation event. It's not like group work where you have someone who organizes and someone who does the research and someone who does a different role. So the team input is meant to be equal across all students. Um, during the application process, um, if you, the, the uh, team-based learning is a very complex process. I'm giving a very quick summary here. But in terms of the application, it's important that the problem is significant, so there's no single you know, yes, no simple answer, that all the teams are working on the same problem, that it is quite specific, so you don't end up with students wandering off into a, a different area of study and that once students have come up with their solution, they reveal their answers simultaneously. And for that reason, we actually purchased some uh, table stands, the type of things you see in a restaurant. And they had a, a set of laminated cards they could put up A, B, C, D solution. And um, then we, could, we also had team names on the card. So that's a quick summary of um, team-based learning. There's the pre-reading part. The readiness assurance, if you find that a team uh, really doesn't agree with your answer, there is an opportunity for an appeal process which involves them going off and reading up the answer and justifying why they think it's the answer and not your answer because you don't really want to have that discussion right in the middle of a teaching session of TBL. So the appeal, the students are allowed to appeal, but they go off and they do that a couple of days later. In terms of the, um, the corrective instruction is just to ensure that everyone in, within all the teams is, um, has come to the uh, common understanding of whatever your pre-reading concepts are, if you think of threshold concepts, and then you move on to the the simultaneous the application. So in our particular context, the immediate challenges we had was the problem with the module choice in that uh, we the teaching allocation for my colleague changed from first year to second year. So immediately we were dealing with students who already had some expectations of university study. Um, we had been hoping to target first years before they'd um, you know, got these expectations. The other institutional constraints concerned the physical space. And you can see on the, the image on the slide, we were working in a lecture theatre which was a converted church. What you can't quite see from the picture is that there were the pillars in the middle of the church, um, which skewed view for some people. There were several screens, but it wasn't an ideal space. And then we had the existing module assessment patterns, which due to constraints on just the changing of these patterns, we had to edge the team-based learning into the five assessments that we had listed already, and also into the, a separated one-hour lecture, one-hour seminar format, and that proved to be quite, um, quite a problem. What we ended up doing, um, having split the students into teams, and uh, it's important in team-based learning that students are put into teams uh, quite large teams of between, say, five and seven students. Um, and the idea is that you select the students on the basis of the reason for their peer tutoring. So we did it on the basis of their income grade and so on their previous grade in economics from the year before. And the idea was that students with more experience in maths would be able to choose the ones with less experience. 
The other issue with implementation was that um, the lecture slots, um, we had to use lecture slots to do the input and the readiness assurance. And then we had um, the seminars for you for doing the application exercise. Uh, the MCQs, which was the readiness assurance process, formed part of the continual assessment um, and we took those, the highest three scores, and we used these devices, um, the turning point devices. They were registered to individual students. So we had a good, good data about it. Um, now, was it worth it? Interestingly, attendance did improve for some of the students, as you can see on the screen, and for some of the students it went down, which um, was another interesting thing. Um, for the female students, although attendance went down, uh, actually it showed that their uh, exam grades did improve, although we don't have complete data on that, so which is why we didn't um, report that. The performance in the final exam, there was a, a different, definite cohort improvement, as you can see, they went up set percentage points, and there was anecdotal evidence not only of better improvement in lectures, but also of improved quality of the writing in, in the exam. In the lectures, uh, I said earlier that we'd had, say, between six and eight students in the lectures towards the end. Whereas through the team-based learning, we actually had up to 80% attendance in the lectures, which was um, interesting. The other thing we found was um, quite an interesting finding was that students um, basically split between really enjoying the module and the team-based learning and the ones who found that it was very difficult and that they couldn't understand the terminology. And one of the things that we think pointed to this was that um, some of the students are what known as uh, novice learners and some are expert learners. So we were dealing with some students who had a very didactic, reproductive approach to learning and others who were more facilitative, transformative learners. So in that was uh, an interesting finding. The other thing that we found um, to accommodate that novice expert learner, I think we will have more enabling activities to help move students in away from the um, didactic approach and more towards the facilitative approach, which of course is a real feature of student-centered learning, which, which is the aspect of team-based learning. Um, we've also requested for the coming year that we will have a two-hour slot for the teaching in order to run a team-based learning session completely because splitting it between the lecture and the seminar was not, not a good thing. We'll have more online resources and I think we will also actually have the lecturer um, giving a scripted version of the lecture online because students did say that they wanted to see that and we'll also work on improving the peer evaluation system. So that's me done for the um, for the slides. That's lovely. Thank you, Judy, very much indeed. Judy, we are just slightly over time, and I'm, I'm yeah. conscious that Liz and Kathy have been waiting very patiently yeah. through the whole yeah. session. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to ask, there were two factual questions which I wasn't able to answer. And again, there's been some absolutely fascinating discussion in the text. Um, the discussion in the text has been very, lo a lot of it's been around the issue of, you know, to what extent you select the teams. You, you answered that point, but it's, it's quite an interesting sort of almost philosophical discussion of the point going on. Um, the two questions, the first one was where you had your student, student viewpoint A and your student point, viewpoint B, what was the approximate breakdown of students, you know, how many of them were in one of those mindsets and how many of them were, were in the other? Um, I think it was really quite even, but the, okay. data came, the data came from focus groups. Okay. And and the focus groups were self-selecting, so we didn't have a big pool of students for the focus groups. Okay. Um, but it, it was a fairly even split, and that's, it was quite that, that, clear That's, as that's well. lovely, thank you. And the final one, the, the other question is, is really, really straightforward. Um, how many facilitators did you have per team? How, how did that work? Um, in the lecture, it was just the lecturer, but the mm -hmm. seminars were taught by three different people, and that was another okay. area where there was a concern. 
that that okay. was uh, not an even experience. Okay, now that's a really interesting point. Re Judy, really thank you. It fitted really nicely within the time slot. So thank you very much. And I'm going to hand over now to Liz. And again, thanks Judy and thanks to Liz and Kathy for, for waiting. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me. And um, I'm Liz Austin. Kathy Malone, my colleague, is going to be managing the chat for us today. Um, and this is research that we've done together around um, student perceptions of effective feedback. And we're from Sheffield Hallam University. Uh, so the aim of the session today um, is same as we did at the uh, Assessment Higher Education Conference. So we're going to present in some of our findings, uh, a mixed methods research project, and it's around feedback that students valued, specifically trying to avoid the word liked or were happy with, uh, but value, and we've, we've created a methodology in order to try and assess that. Uh, so the methodology looked something like this. Um, we accessed written feedback uh, that was randomly sampled from across four social science courses. Uh, the feedback was drawn from a range of core and elective modules that were across all levels of undergraduate study. There were a range of assessments uh, in the sample, so uh, essay, essays, presentations, reports, um, but not exams. I know we've talked about that previously today. A uh, couple of phases to the research, so a qualitative analysis of the whole sample, which I had done with a student researcher, and then Kathy and I did some focus groups, and in these focus groups, the students were asked to read and evaluate anonymized pieces of feedback using criteria that we'd created from the literature. And you can see in the little diagram at the side there that we have split um, the uh, um, the, the scores from the evaluations that the students did, um, which uh, so the, evalu the averages allowed us to um, uh, to rank the pieces of feedback in a top 25 and a bottom 25, um, and this created a corpus A and a corpus B. So in corpus A, we had 25 pieces of feedback that were highly scoring, uh, and highly scoring means that the students uh, evaluated them highly rather than they were high scoring grades. So there was a range of grades in each of these corpus. Uh, corpus B is our low scoring feedback. So these are pieces of feedback that the students um, valued uh, lower than the rest based on the averages that we created. It's worth mentioning that uh, the students were reading feedback written by staff that they knew uh, within the same uh, discipline, but the feedback wasn't theirs. Uh, so they annotated the evaluations using the scoring system that we created, um, and they reflected on what they did as well. So we also had some student annotation of the pieces of feedback, and we audio recorded the conversations that they were having. Um, so we got audio recording, and we got transcriptions for analysis. So that was our methodology. What did we find? Uh, we had a number of different uh, findings that we mentioned at the conference last week. We can't possibly talk about them all today. So the ones that are highlighted, praise, length, achievement, and interpersonal positioning are going to be the ones that we talk about today. Um, these were frequency-driven findings, essentially, um, relating to corpus analysis. Um, and each of these categories represent differences we identified between corpus A, which was the high scoring, and corpus B, which was the low scoring. Uh, so I'll talk about each one in turn. We're going to start with praise. Now, what you can see is we've, we've illuminated uh, the focus group comments in purple. Um, and we'll start with praise because it kind of acted as an umbrella across our findings, really. Um, so the effective dimension uh, began to frame how we were looking and interpreting our research findings. Um, and students appeared really sensitive to how praise was positioned and their overall tone of the feedback. Um, and we saw that um, you know, quite strikingly in the focus groups. And what we can see here from the comment in purple, uh, one of the students who was looking at a piece of feedback that they were being asked to evaluate, um, and their comment, you know, if, if I'd have got that, this is how I would have felt. There's obviously a risk here to retention. They're not necessarily wanting to engage that member of staff. Progression, and some might argue, I think, overall well-being um, with that emotional reaction to, uh, to that piece of work. So praise and how students reacted to praise uh, was really interesting, and that kind of uh, acts as an umbrella at the beginning of our research. The next piece of uh, research finding that I want to talk about is length. And whilst I'm talking about length, I'd be really interested to know uh, your views on feedback length. So written feedback length in whatever form that takes. 
Um, so using your voting buttons while I carry on talking, um, do you think students prefer longer feedback? Um, and then if you want to provide any comments in the chat, do you think there's an optimum feedback length in your subject area? And uh, Cathy will be monitoring that as I carry on. Okay. So these were our findings about length. Um, so we found that there was a substantial difference in the size of the corpora. So if you look at the, uh, the first row, you can see there were more words in corpus A, so the high scoring, uh, the high scoring feedback, which might lead us to believe that students prefer longer feedback. Um, there was also a moderate positive correlation between length of feedback and overall student evaluation. But you can also see that Corpus B, the bottom 25, had the longest and the shortest text. Um, and there is a difference here on the type of, exam of the examination of the type of feedback. Um, so the lengthiest feedback included large sections of textual commentary, which was this preferred, and we can see that in Corpus B. And students appeared to prefer feedback that summed up their overall performance. This is supported by some of the student annotations that we can see in purple. The comments also reveal how, how students interpret shorter text, cursory, formulaic, hasty, and again you can see the student reactions in purple there. So whilst text counts provide a fairly direct measure of length, completeness might be a more sophisticated way to measure uh, student expectations. And we can, we can look at average sentence length, so uh, how students appear to react to uh, 20 words per sentence length in comparison to others. And there's something quite distinct happening there. So that's length. Moving on to achievement. So the word good uh, appeared um, with really high frequency across the whole sample, but the way it was used in uh, the distinct corpora was quite uh, interesting. Um, so staff were all using it, which I acknowledge, I think, that staff understand the need to be positive. But looking at these two uh, examples here, you can see that how it was used is different. So Corpus A used good much more precisely, so good overview of causes of crime. Corpus B use of good was much more vague, more generic, so good essay or good points. In addition, Corpus B used good in a way which immediately modified, so good but. And students became, and uh, we can see that in the, the, the feedback that they uh, were saying was, was low scoring, was the ones that positioned good next to immediate criticism. Good but you could have, or good but, and, and, and went on to criticise. So how the use of praise and achievement and good is used, again, became something that was interesting between the two types of, uh, uh, of student valued feedback. Okay, so that was good. And I move on to talk about interpersonal positioning. Um, and again, if you have any thoughts on this, please do let us know. So who appears in your feedback? And I'm going to specifically talk about the use of personal pronouns. So I, you, your, or we. Okay. So think about how you position yourselves in the text, how the students are positioned in the text. And if you've got any comments again on this, then please do let us know. So in our research, this is how uh, we analyze the use of, of personal pronouns in this way. So we found an extremely high keyness, and some explanation there around keyness, um, keyness scores of you and your in both corpora. So the use of you and your were very high frequency across the whole sample. And what we're suggesting here is this reflects the narrow topic focus of the feedback and demonstrates a marked use of personal pronouns but with little associated or no associated use of I or we. So that so we in particular didn't occur in either corpus. The use of I, so the tutor use of I, occurs substantially more in corpus A, so the high value, than in B, in raw frequency counts. Um, and consider that the use of this type of pronoun is one way of a more dialogic or quasi-dialogic and inclusive tone can be established. So what we, try, what, what we concluded is it's very difficult to read this feedback as neutral or objective commentary. And there's something specific about power relations implicit in this use of language. Um, and it also means it's impossible not to take this personally when you're talking about you and positioning I. 
So again, student re readers appeared very sensitive to the tenor of communication struck in feedback. And it's very high stakes text and a narrow topic focus. And again, very interested to understand your opinions and then how you position yourself and your students as part, uh, as part of your feedback. So we've to only talked about a few findings there. Um, and there are more that we talked about at the conference. Um, so I'm just going to do a few conclusions. And I want to show you a couple of examples of, 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 of how we've been using it. So in conclusion, we did find distinct differences in language across the two corpora, um, noting that obviously some of our findings we haven't used today. We have found the notion of discursive orientation as a key distinctive feature between corpus A and corpus B, and how the agency of the student is reflected in the writing. As we found in phase one of the research, when we looked at the complete sample, the effective dimension, so the emotive dimension to written text, and the effective response by the reader is a key consideration in student feedback. Um, and finally, the notion of completeness, so bringing this all together, rather than thinking about these findings as component parts um, uh, needs to be considered. So rather than just focusing on one element, and we've had lots of feedback from, from staff saying, I should just include the word I, or I should just write longer feedback. Um, what our suggestion is, is that we want to, you want to consider these findings holistically, rather than thinking about components which function independently. And what Cathy and I have been doing is um, uh, providing CPD within our own institution to develop feedback practice using some of these findings. Uh, we're particularly interested in uh, using appreciative inquiry approaches, uh, developing peer review using some of, these, um, uh, some of these findings, and supporting staff and teams to develop uh, their own practice. So just finally, I wanted to show you a couple of things before I finish, uh, and we're running short time. Um, this was a feedback uh, um, uh, pro forma that was consistently scored highly by our students. So you can see that it had a very uh, specific structure. It did have a marking grid, but we didn't analyze the marking grid. We just looked at the text. Uh, it was specifically um, highlighting praise. It specifically focused forward orientation, which is something else we, we found in this um, uh, in this research, and it, it, it was consistently formulated. Um, and it was interesting to us that this appeared regularly in, this, in the, uh, the feedback that students valued highly. The last thing from me is uh, just an example of how we've been using CPD. So this is a, a style guide that we've created, um, some kind of do's and don'ts, uh, but again, very much stressing the kind of holistic uh, dimension uh, to our findings so that we shouldn't just take one at a time. You should think about this as an overall, uh, an overall summary of effective written feedback practice. OK, I think that's about it from us. Um, yeah, if you've got any questions or any through Sally, then uh, yeah, that's my last slide. Thank you very much indeed, Liz. And it's worked really well because there's been a lot of discussion, huge amount of discussion again, and Kathy has been, uh, been, been responding, so that's great. Um, there's been two particularly interesting themes in the uh, in the chat around this. One has been around this whole use of of I in um, in comment, um, and the sort of discussion. I mean, I don't know if you would just want to say a little bit more about it, um, just just for the benefit of everybody, Liz. Um, it was the discussion was whether it was I that was therefore initiating dialogue or whether it was I that was, if you like, softening the focus. Um, do, do you want to just say a little bit more about that first? Yeah, um, I, think it, I think it was both, actually. Um, I was often used to soften criticism. Um, and it was also a, yeah, a way of kind of introducing kind of mitigation. Um, but we did see that I was being used to position um, uh, the uh, the tutor in connection to the student. So um, I would I would like I thought um, um, I would like you to consider. So it, it had some element of dialogue, but it did have, have that notion of mitigation um, in relation to to a, to a critique as well. It's really really interesting stuff. I'm not at all expert in this. I'm a physicist, so you know, it's, it's uh, but it's it's really really interesting as you sort of reflect on your own practice, which is I guess what you've done with people there. Um, the other thing I'd just like to comment on, really, just to come to an end, and I, I guess it brings us to 
begins to summarise what happened at the whole conference and, and why we wanted to put together this, this little sort of, if you like, snapshot of the conference. Of course, when you're at a conference, it's not one presentation you get, it's, it's the whole picture. And um, uh, uh, Liz and uh, Kathy were actually on in, in session one, in the, in the very first session right at the beginning of what was 10, sort of set up lots of parallel sessions. And uh, I went to session. And then sometime, I don't know, about a day later, um, I went to a session, incredibly useful session, I can't actually remember who gave it, I, I need to do research on that, on, on audio feedback. Now I know there's been a lot of work done on audio and there's been a discussion again about that and, and Tim and, and Kevin and Matthew have been saying that, you know, the, the, the debate that that, that that usually engenders. Um, but there was an incredibly useful discussion at that in that session about sometimes some of the language they use when you're saying it rather than when you write it, um, you know, can have a very different impact. I don't know, Kathy, Liz, whether you've um, any sort of ideas on, on, on that. Obviously, it is written feedback you've looked at, but whether you see it's an area that you, you might explore further. Yeah, I, I think we, we looked at written feedback because that was the dominant uh, uh, mode of feedback within um, the department that we looked at and actually within the institution. Um, but yeah, I went to a couple of the sessions at the conference um, that talked about dialogue um, and this notion of, of, of dialogue in audio and video um, absolutely brings that kind of interpersonal uh, element into focus. Um, but if you are using written text, um, I think David Bode talked about it as, as quasi-dialogic. Um, so to introduce I and, and some strategies for um, uh, interpersonal uh, um, uh, positioning in written feedback can be one way of doing it without the audio video, video if you're not quite there yet. Um, but it's, I think that notion of dialogue brings it all together in whatever, whatever form you're using, really. It's been fantastic. I'd like to thank uh, Liz, thank you, Cathy, as well, for, for sterling work in the chat box. Um, I'd like to thank all of the speakers for, for um, you know, it, it, obviously it's a really bit more complicated putting the whole thing together with three speakers than, than it usually is, but it, I think it's worked really well and hopefully given some sort of flavour and lots more discussion. Uh, I would like to thank one final person and that's Matthew. Um, he said at the beginning that he's actually in, in Dublin, so he's at another conference in the hotel room in Dublin now. I think he said, Matthew, it's the first time this has happened. Um, so thanks for giving us the, you know, the possibility for taking this forward, even though I know it's it's not been that straightforward from your end and um, thanks everyone for, for a great webinar and I will hand back to Matthew and shoot off rapidly because I have a meeting with my vice chancellor <laughs> okay bye everyone bye. yeah thank you Sally um, I'll thanks Sally off you go uh, we are just about closing because I also have to rush off to the um, morning sessions for the conference but if people could please fill in this survey feedback survey uh, if you don't also have to rush off that quickly. That would be much appreciated. But thank you very much. I'm going to um, shut down the recording. And we'll see you all again next month for another Transforming Assessment webinar.